It's been a real hard couple of weeks leading up to my 27th birthday in South Sudan. <laughs> Coworker of mine nearly bled to death after two men tried to murder him in our compound. A splinter in one of the wood clubs they were swinging at him got hammered into my left eye during that same attack, and now there's this big floating ball of nothing hovering where I used to see, and it would be there forever. Happy birthday to <laughs> me. The bravery that had come with ignorance was also gone. The moment I believed that my time was up, I saw how everybody does actually indeed die alone, and surviving did absolutely nothing to change this opinion. Our UNICEF country director for Sudan sent around a vague email commending the bravery of those involved in the incident. That's what they call it when we die or get maimed, by the way, a critical incident. And then they wanted to go away because it makes them look bad. And maybe it was because, maybe it was just my imagination, or, but it seemed to me that my coworkers got uncomfortable whenever I came around after the critical incident. Like I was a reminder of what could happen anytime, anywhere, if somebody just took the time to get angry enough to do something about it. The all day, every day confinement between either the concrete walls of our office or our not so safe house with the same dozen people was starting to do my head in. I've been coping just fine until my body demanded what it always does when, it's, when I'm faced with imminent mortality, procreation, or at least the motions that could lead to it. <laughs> Y'all know, a warm body that one could pour its rage and fear into and be absolved through orgasm, the baptism of mutual fluids, somebody to let me be a slobbering animal that felt everything simply in base fucking. <laughs> there was just nobody in my world I could fuck. My Australian lady friend, Jo, was the closest contender, and our relationship had already been sealed, though. She'd assigned me the role of her fake gay bestie, her words, and the space between Jo's legs may as well have been as vacant of genitals as a Barbie doll's for all the sexual chemistry we had together. <laughs> Romantic entanglement with the locals was forcefully discouraged, which left sex for we aid workers and peacekeepers to be sorted out with our very small and very incestuous community. But between companies of Russian anti-mine specialists and Indian and Bengali peacekeepers, the expatriate gender balance in South Sudan resembled Alaska. Yeah. <laughs> Joe did the work for me and summarized her, se her sexual prospects as one of the only few women in country this way. Well, the odds are good, but the goods are really odd. <laughs> So far during her stay in South Sudan, specifically Juba, she'd had nothing to show for her love life but a violent yeast infection <laughs> given to her by a half-black Englishman who went off and cheated on her while she was laying sick with fever in his own tent. And now, on top of it all, it was February. Somebody told me that the new air word for February in Sudan was the same as their word for fire, and if it wasn't true, it fucking should have been. <laughs> There's this thing called the equator. It's called opposite town, population me. It had been hot before February, stupefying hot in fact, but this shit was just mean. I had to lubricate the inside of my nose with Vaseline just to pick it. And I had to pick it in order to breathe. All of that dust and dried blood created these very complex crystalline sculptures deep up inside the sinuses that were really, truly almost beautiful in their complexity <laughs> and yet terrifying in their discovery. <laughs> oh, this is how depression starts, Justin. Miserable, scared, alone during a very vulnerable time. That's what Joe meant. Somehow having a birthday go uncelebrated still managed to make me sad even though it was the least of my troubles. But Jo, God bless her, she understood this. We are not going to let it pass like every other day here with a bottle of shitty wine and travel scrabble. And not one to make empty statements, Jo, she had a plan. The American consulate, they had the only swimming pool in all of South Sudan. The amount of geography covering more than Western Europe. And they were having a pool party, the clever fellows as a ploy to bring all the women to Juba to them. <laughs> Joe was one such woman. 
and I was her chaperone. She insisted that this was all we would need to get through governmental security, and she was right. <laughs> she talked Marcio, our security officer, into giving us a ride there, but he would not come inside. Come get a suntan, Marcio. Find a yank to give you a little handy or a blowy. <laughs> and Marcio chuckled as Joe's flattery, but he declined. He conceded that Americans did make good soldiers, but he did not want them for his playmates. In his eyes and words, they could be sloppy, and that could lead to a very awkward conflict with his job as the security specialist who kept us all alive. <laughs> there were a few local Dinka security guards who were checking names against a guest list at the party's gate, but we were both ushered right past without question once Joe approached. The consulate unfolded on the other side of that wall like a Motel 6 spread out entirely across one single story. Spacious, interconnecting, air-conditioned bungalows formed natural walkways and gardens. They all led to this large wood and stone bungalow in the back, lit by wrought iron electric lamps that shaded a bar. Big fan. And there, ringed by the patio chairs and blankets spread out on the hot, porous concrete, gleamed that prized swimming pool. Nothing bigger than a suburban backyard watering hole. But there were maybe 50 half-naked people in it. And this was the largest single gathering of people without malnutrition that I'd seen in months. <laughs> By the time we got there, the water had turned gray from the dust that had washed off those bodies. And, and some of those, actually countable on at least two or three pairs of hands, belonged to women. And I'd forgotten how an incredible thing the body of a young woman was. I'd begun to believe that the whole of humanity was made out of European men's pot bellies and the wrinkles of ancient Ethiopian women. But now here, here, oh behold, was a young Peruvian peacekeeper being thrown, giggling, squealing in fact, into the water. And a red-headed Irish woman from the World Food Program crawled over to a beach towel to sun herself. It was a country club shit show in the middle of North Africa's backwater. And I would have beaten anyone here tonight with a fucking club if you tried to take it from me. <laughs> I, would, uh, I was offered a beer, which turned into five, is as per usual when I drink. None of the beers are all the beers. That's my genetic motto. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> but I was in good company, at least. They had to fish out the empty bottles of Tusker Lager from the pool with a net at least once an hour. And as I sat there, taking all of this in through the softer focus of a drunken lens, it was so easy to forget for me that on the other side of this very tall, very deep wall of concertina wire and topped concrete that enclosed our little romp, one of the poorest countries in the world was scrounging for food and water, which of course was the entire point of having the party in the first place, to forget. I tried talking to some of the girls, but found myself all of a sudden very newly shy. I smelled the stench of my own neediness. I was preemptively embarrassed by it. All that glistening skin, all that nerd-honed wit stored up in my brain, water, water, everywhere, and I'd gone hydrophobic. <laughs> I totally froze, and I was too ashamed to ask for the attention that the living just take. So it was a relief for me when this lanky Midwesterner about my age asked if I was an American and then introduced himself as Latham when I said I was. He had this rolling drawl that evoked for me this kind of young, pre-radioactive John Wayne. <laughs> and then he volunteered to me that he had been a U.S. Army helicopter pilot in Iraq before being seconded to the State Department in South Sudan. And in the very succinct conversation that followed for us, he, I learned from Latham that, A, he just flew transport helos in the war, but his brother piloted attack choppers and killed people every day and fucking loved it. Spent a portion of his childhood growing up in South America where he learned Spanish but, quote, still couldn't speak Mexican to save my life. <laughs> Had the opportunity, lucky boy, to shoot a burglar in his backyard once with a shotgun, and his dad made him go out and drag the body in afterwards like it was a pheasant. <laughs> and he just arrived in Juba the day prior and would remain there for an entire year, a government tour of duty, and he was already very, very concerned about finding women who would let him sleep with him. 
Iraq was bad enough, man, but my con porn collection is spent and memorized, and I can't go another fucking year like that. <laughs> Latham interrupted his worries very briefly to wave over a man, short and stocky, but handsome in a way that I'd want to be if I were a dad. <laughs> that was Scott. Scott was from Washington State. Scott's face sported large splotches of bleach white skin, the texture of uncooked pretzel dough over his arms and legs also. He explained without my asking that he had been caught downwind of an Iraqi chemical plant during the first Gulf War, right about the time the US Air Force blew it to shit. The resulting gas cloud had melted the top two layers of exposed flesh wherever the mist settled. All he said was, <laughs> when we screw up, we screw up big. So as compensation, Scott received 70% disability in a job in Washington, where a supervisor very promptly told him to go spend a vacation year in Juba as a defense analyst. <laughs> and this was Scott's last time in country, last 16 hours, and Latham, his replacement. So the three of us, we pulled up chairs poolside and a crate of beer, all for ourselves, and I asked Scott how he felt about returning to the land of cold beer and indifferent countrymen. He said the longer he had been deployed, the more he hated being abroad. But at the same time, he didn't know what else he could do anymore. It was too late for him. Especially, he gestured, you know, with a face. So most of the party by then was putting their clothes on around, and dinner was waiting for them back at their respective compounds all over Juba, and curfew was rapidly approaching, which was a very serious matter. So Joe came over and let me know that our car had come, but I had told her to let go. Go ahead, without me, I'd be fine, because I was drunk. And I was content to stay that way with men who had been in dangerous places and behaved bravely. Because at that time, I rationalized that accepting me into their company made me braver by association, and I needed more than anything else at that goddamn moment to feel brave. So we three talked well into the night about Juba's strategic vulnerability the impossibility of evacuating anyone if the war restarted, which we all expected any day, any moment. We lamented how awful it would feel to be left behind watching one's entire illusion of security just fly away without them. And we did not consider that we might be projecting all of our insecurities into scenarios that were really metaphors for our current emotional state. It was past midnight when I finally decided that I actually wanted my bed. Scott insisted that I stay at the compound, but I decided, no, I can walk it. I had an impeccable sense of direction. <laughs> After all, I'd been living like a veal calf, sandwiched between two different pins for the past months. It made no difference to me whatsoever. I was prepared. That's how soused I was. So prepared. Neither did the lack of the moon or the incalculable darkness between hither and thither. And finally, Scott intervened. He let me have my speech and said, sure, sure. No, I believe you. You can walk it, man. You can walk it. You could also get shot in the fucking face the minute you go outside that gate. I'm not going to try to stop you. I'm just saying I wouldn't do it. Now, coming from somebody who was much more experienced with danger than myself, this was a very effective argument. <laughs> Latham piped in. He said, what the hell do you have to do that's so important that you want to run out into this night plastered? And for some reason, probably the same reason I thought I could find my way home, I made the terrible mistake of saying, it's my birthday. <laughs> that's exactly the thing you never want to say to men who don't know how to celebrate without somebody getting hurt. Scott bolted straight upright to retrieve a bottle of vodka and three glasses from inside the bungalow, and then he poured a round of shots for my birthday, and then another shot to celebrate Latham's arrival, and then, at our insistence, another shot to celebrate his coming departure. And then we all got quiet for a while. <laughs> Scott was the first to break a silence. He stood up and declared, I have to take a dump. <laughs> this would be a dump from which he would not return. <laughs> Eventually, Latham and I, we caught on, and we wobbled through the corridors of the Motel 6 into his room, where I pitched myself straight through the mosquito netting into the extra bed in his room, and I watched the ceiling pirouette above me. Latham sat down on his bunk some three feet away, and he looked at me thoughtfully, and he said, Hey, 
how often do you jerk off out here? <laughs> and I told him that for the first few weeks, I was an athlete at jerking off. But after a while, my imagination just completely failed me. This was a period of going through the motions after that for me, and then just for lack of anything better to do, and eventually I just gave up and stopped entirely because I saddened myself. <laughs> and because I believe in paying it forward, I noticed I had visibly depressed Latham. <laughs> but Latham was a real soldier. And soldiers know nothing if not perseverance in the face of hardship. And that's when our conversation took a corner. <laughs> hey, how big are you, dude? <laughs> I had a girlfriend who measured one, so I told him. And then he asked me to prove it. And that was the first time in my entire life that I admitted to being too drunk to sustain an erection and did not feel one goddamn ounce of shame about it. <laughs> not to be deterred, Latham was willing to work with me. He asked if I'd ever done a circle jerk, and then explained his reasoning before I could even answer him. He goes, you know, sometimes my buddy and I in Iraq, we'd help each other out, and I confessed that I had never had such a good friend in all my goddamn life. <laughs> Oh, he murmured, you know, he was visibly crestfallen. And then he said, hey, let's just keep this, you know, between ourselves then. And of course I agreed. <laughs> so this period of awkward silence followed, as it always does after a rejection has been made. And I can't stand watching people embarrassed. I can't stand it. It's the worst thing for me. So I said the first thing that popped into my mind, well, thanks for a happy birthday. <laughs> and then I realized, stripped down to my boxer shorts, lying in a bed four feet away, the echo of my refusal sounding teasing and insincere even to my own ears, I was thinking, what about me did not suggest I would be the kind of friend who could jerk a buddy off? And you know what? I wished I was. Because here we were, two young men in the peak of our youth, adventuring in an exciting and dangerous place very far from home, troubled by all of the many and varied things we'd seen and primed to have a heated love affair. And the best we could do was each other. That was not how the story had been sold to us. I would have liked to have been able to give him some peace. I knew how badly I needed it myself, and, you know, at least his problem had a very clear solution. <laughs> the problem is, I've just never seen a dick that didn't bum me out. <laughs> Not even my own. It's just how I'm built. I can't help it, I'm scared of him. <laughs> so I just rolled over, and I pretended to sleep until I finally actually did. So when I came to, <laughs> when I came to, some hours later, uh, my eyes opened to Latham shambling into the bathroom. His laptop was tucked under his arm the way that swimmers will carry their towels. And very soon a sound issued from behind the door like a cat that was violently lapping at a dish of milk. <laughs> Scott knocked on the door uh, then, around the same time, let himself in after finally returning from his dump he'd taken nine hours prior. <laughs> and he had a, a pitcher of Bloody Mary mix in his hand. And he goes, my head is split, bro. I need to borrow that vodka to mix up that medicine. So I handed him the bottle at the same time that Latham reemerged. And he looks at me, and he's kind of startled that I'm dressed and standing. And he goes, oh, are you, are you leaving, dude? Yeah, yeah, I said, I, I, I gotta, I better get back to it. So we just shrugged, we shook hands. I knew he had not washed his. <laughs> we both knew that. And we looked each other in the eye while we did it. Because this was a handshake to seal a pact. On the walk home, 
right then under that too bright, too hot sun, I very much saw it plainly that I would have never possibly made it if I'd actually tried to leave the night before. I was just this ignorant, dumb kid alone in this darkness that I'd gone and purposefully lost myself in. No. No, 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 no. It's always better to huddle together until you know the daylight's coming back. Thank you.